Hey, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Damian Walter. Damian uh, is a writer and a storyteller. Uh, he's written for The Guardian, BBC, Wired, uh, and runs a popular podcast on science fiction and storytelling and myth and film, and uh, also conversant in the paradigm of metamodernism, engaging with the paradigm, and uh, I'm sure has his own thoughts about it. So I really wanted to, yeah, uh, talk a little bit about um, myth and story and the sense of kind of uh, the role of myth making and storytelling in popular culture today. Yeah, I've been really impressed by Damien's work and really interested in it. So I wanted to uh, dig into it. So anyway, thanks, Damien. Really appreciate you uh, being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, I think you saw one of the, the videos about Marvel that I posted yes. for the Metamodernism group, because yes. I think it, it, it overlapped into the, the Metamodern area. Because actually, I posted it with a a, a different title, which mm. didn't work at all. And I thought, there's something else I'm talking about here, and it's like what's emerging from yeah. the Marvel boss. Yeah, and yeah, that yeah. word yeah. like emerge. Mm. It seems to be kind of at the center of the meta modern community and sure. uh, the emerge podcast, of course. So, that, I think that's where we kind of overlapped into a discussion here. Yeah, I think so. And and I think so. A kind of common framing. Um, it's you know we can debate whether it's useful or not but there is this sort of frequent framing of our situation uh these days in relationship say to the meaning crisis etc that um you know post modernity was characterized by this loss of grand narratives by the rejection of grand narratives and there goes myth and sort of the big stories of civilization and this and that right and i think that uh there's a kind of growing recognition that stories uh myths and narratives are really important for meaning making and sense making in the world and that sort of a thing. And then it's sort of a question, well, you know, well, so what are the stories today? What are the narratives and the myths being told today? Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that these would be being generated by, you know, big production houses, big movie studios uh, doesn't like doesn't sit very well with me. Right. This notion and mm -hmm. I, in our in our or our little uh, kind of messages back and forth and setting this conversation up, I I refer to this as the idea of big myth, you know, like that uh, these mm -hmm. stories are being generated um, like in the Marvel universe and whatnot and uh the idea that folks would consider these as being the emerging grand narratives of our time seems uh it just it, I, i'm uncomfortable with it for many reasons we can get into mm. but uh, yeah why don't you set that idea up a little bit and i and in the context of that like what do you think of that idea like uh, are, are is the marvel cinematic universe and these big stories being told on the on the big screen like avatar and this sort of a thing is that the mythos of today or is is something else going on there or yeah i don't know what are your thoughts on that yeah i love that term big myth uh, I think it's very meta modern, and that means we have to be careful with it. Uh, uh, I enjoy the fact that it connotes uh, a potential conspiracy theory uh, uh, pr producing the the new mythos of our civilization, uh, and we can we can enjoy that in a in a meta modern way. But uh, I feel if we talk about big myth, we will find it coming back to us like six months from now as an an actual <laughs> conspiracy theory. Mm. Uh, and it's it's not a conspiracy, but it's what so many conspiracies turn around, that there are these structural things going on in our society that unless you have some some real study and expertise in them, uh, it's very difficult to see how they're operating without that shadowy cabal of people. In this case, you know, maybe four Hollywood producers, one from Disney and one from NGM, and they're all meeting up to to say, we'll make this the new mythos of our civilization which isn't what's happening it's much more it's much more ordinary than that it's about profit seeking uh and and i call these uh these big franchises uh which is kind of giving the game away that we've started using this term for them anyway which, which comes from mcdonald's you know mcdonald's and starbucks these are franchises and we've done the same thing to our culture we've turned them into corporate entertainment franchises. Uh, and I've tried to memify this idea so it can it can take off a bit and we can think about what these these enormous businesses are doing. Uh, and I tend to compare it just as a rule of thumb to to fast food, to to McDonald's and the Big Mac. 
that what we've done over something like 40 years is Star Wars has done to our culture what Starbucks did for coffee, basically. We've mm. we've taken it and we've taken the essence out of it. And we can somewhat blame Joseph Campbell for this, for his his brilliant studies of myth. And then he kind of derives the monomyth from that study. Uh, and what happens with that kind of thing is he's doing that with a, a kind of rich, generous intention. And then there are people who just take that and go, that's just the equation for making compelling stories on a kind of production line basis in the way that yeah. a Big Mac kind of hacks your your dietary desires for fat and carbohydrates. Yeah. We've done the same thing with with our myth making today. So Star Wars and Marvel and Star Trek, they've all kind of extracted the essence of myth. Uh, and then they put it into a format which may or may not actually contain any of the nutrition uh, that we actually need from our mythos. But it's tremendously successful nonetheless. So yeah. I think that touches on where your discomfort with the whole thing was. Yes, be. very much so. And I think that that's a great framing of it. And I would very much agree with that. And and for the record too, yeah, that that is actually the very thing that I was trying to get at with the idea of big myth. You know, it's sort of like mm. big business, um, big pharma, that sort of a thing, right? There's just, but it, that's the issue ultimately with all of these is that there's a soullessness that comes from the profit motive. And uh, to use the example of fast food franchises, you lose the nutrients and you just get this sort of um, superficial kind of uh, shock to your taste buds that has no <laughs> redeeming quality. Um, um, and then so for me, then the question is, so I think I think all that is I think I agree with that. Um, but then the question is like, well, but these seem to be the folks who are telling the big stories, right? Like if an alien spaceship were to come down and be like, OK, what are the big stories, you know, of today? Where, where you know, what is the mythos of the time? Well, OK, of course, we can look back into the history of the annals of the ages and we can see, well, when people used to read, it came from these literature books. And when people used to sit around the campfire would, you know, have these sorts of stories being told in that context. But now that there are big cinema complexes, uh, we must look to the Marvel universe. And we must look to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these sorts of things. Right. And um, I think that that breaks down. I feel like in the very process of this sort of um, the, the sort of industrialization of mythos has lost the very essence of it in the process. Um, mm -hmm. And so that would be like a claim. So I guess there's two things there is one is, I mean, do you base Would you agree with that essentially that 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 would seem to be the case? Or do you think that there are things coming out of the film industry that really do main, you know, retain that kind of mythic essence that mm -hmm. could be working at that level? Um, I guess we could start there. I mean, is that? Yeah. yeah. No. And one of the things that I try and do in in the science fiction podcast and the YouTube channel is is sort the things that are coming out from the the industrial entertainment complex into the things that are just uh, the, the mass-produced stuff uh, and the places where artists and myth-makers, storytellers have stepped into that industry and they're actually producing things, things of value. So this year we had, like, very surprisingly... Um, and or a Star Wars story. So this has come out of the same mass entertainment mill as lots of other very failed Star Wars stuff. And you have lots of very angry Star Wars fans, many of us aging well into middle age now. Uh, and the, that mythos has, has, has failed for a long time because of its commercialization, I think, primarily. Uh, and then you have a real artist who who sneaks back in and smuggles out some real storytelling uh, and myth making and I, i've done quite a lot of talking about that specific story on the on the science fiction podcast but the general picture is what we're doing with this thing mythos i think i i saw one of your interviews uh, i think with hansi uh daniel uh or it, i'm not sure if it was that one but you kind of made the point that we have all of these os words from uh, classical Greek culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I like to kind of reiterate the point that I think we do have this history of mythos, but we're, we're also reinventing it 
as a term for ourselves in the modern world. And we're just taking that that classical Greek term and making it something new. Uh, and I think what it's talking about is uh, how we have we've kind of buried our shared story, our mythos. We try to deny that we need one, and that seeded the territory of it simply to to big corporations. But when you look back at the history of of mythos, it always has these different levels that for some reason it's very difficult for us to to think about the way that we're embedded in stories as storytelling beings so they just kind of bubble along uh and through the whole history of storytelling you have a level of the mythos that is is folk tale is is happening far below the radar of the powers mm. of a culture and therefore it isn't recorded uh, we don't have much record of of what the mythos of humanity actually was. We only know when uh, the the kings or the priest castes or the corporations come along, and they they pick something out of that bubbling cauldron of mythos, and they say this is now the official story of our culture on some level, and then it becomes recorded, and we only receive the 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 powers version of what that of what that was and i think we have that similar situation now that something like the marvel stories for decades they were really on the folktale level comics were not a big business they were something that appealed to a very particular part of the the culture and they developed very genuine myths so i think if you look at spider-man or captain america batman superman the reason they're so powerful for audiences is because of all that period where they were bubbling under the surface as a subculture and then as soon as they're dragged into the light they start to lose that that energy mm. until yeah. an artist comes along and reinvents them again well that's that's interesting though because there's a there's a lot there. there this is very interesting because on the one hand mm. uh i don't know there's also something about that that doesn't quite sit with me either because mm -hmm. if that's true like like i think about homer like I think you're right. Uh, there's always been this tie between, you know, power and wealth and resource and the stories that get told, certainly. Um, but I also I want to I want to not necessarily just concede the idea that, like, all of our myths have just been the ones that have been retained by, you know, powerful forces, mm -hmm. the sort of like kind of more cynical yeah, view so. that, you know, only the victors mm -hmm. write this, the history, that sort of a thing. Like uh, there's a part of me that wants to think that there, there's always this dynamic interplay of things bubbling up and that, that, that is somehow able to speak to a large enough segment of the society that um, it, it kind of uh, gets carried along. But what I'm, another thing that comes up for me though, is like, I wonder, even when this really does work or has worked, um, like, for example, with the original Star Wars uh, films that that really did seem to work at this mythic level almost, or you mentioned comic books before they became kind of uh, commercialized into this big business, that there was a folktale quality to them. Even there, I'm, I find it interesting because I, I don't know if they really do operate quite as myths per se. And by that, I mean, like, I, I, I think in my mind, I compare that to like the stories of the Bible, let's say, right? And like, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think about mythos in that sense, it's like, oh, okay, you can go show up Sunday morning and a priest or a pastor can have a story about Abraham for, you know, every week of the year and just over and over and over again, they'll just keep. And, and for some reason, when we talk about the stories of the Bible, um, or, you know, the Bhagavad Gita or the great scriptures, mm. right? They're still different than the way people are interacting with like, uh, you know, Spider-Man and Luke Skywalker. So mm. I don't know, what, what do you, what do you think is the difference there? Or, or would you say that Spider-Man or, or Star Wars, um, original Star Wars, let's say, really does rise to the same level? Not yet. Mm. But we could we could speculate in a science fiction way on a on a future. Perhaps it would take some collapse of civilization. Perhaps we'd have to degrade the the information framework of our culture. Uh, and you could arrive at a point uh, where you had kind of shrines to to Superman and Batman and Spider-Man on on each of your street corners. Um, because I think what we're talking about here is 
how stories evolve into myths. Uh, and because of the, the, the invisible, unrecorded nature of the mythos for most of history, we again, this is just something we can speculate on. Uh, but I think I'm making the argument here that uh, these stories which come out of our, uh, our folk storytelling culture, so in the 60s, that was comic books. They're then on a kind of conveyor belt of evolutionary forces towards becoming that that status of a mythic story uh, in our culture. And you see this kind of degradation of uh, stories, or you might call it a degradation, or you might say it's the other way. You know, um, I think the last time I saw the statistic, something like 50% of Americans believe that Sherlock Holmes is uh, a historical character. Oh, interesting. Uh, which is why so many people go to Baker Street, because o over the, the through them like the myths of history, it's very difficult for us to sort what was an invented folk tale and what is a historical narrative. Uh, so, of course, we have this struggle with the Bible stories. Like, is Moses a historical narrative or is it a mythical allegorical story? Um, I'd say the Genesis myths, they seem to be much more on the, the mythical end of that spectrum to me. But again, we, we have to speculate about all of this. We don't have definite facts for it. Yeah. I, I think we're, I'm definitely making the argument that Spider-Man, for instance, is in progress being judged about whether he will become a kind of member of the modern pantheon of gods for our world. Yeah. What are your thoughts on storytelling and narrative um, and myth uh, that, you know, I guess are 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 more nutritious? You'd say, you know, that that really are maybe more effectively fulfilling those sorts of roles. Do you see things like that coming out of culture these days? And if so, like where and how? Mm. Uh, well, one of the words I'm using a lot in my criticism at the moment is uh, mythopathos. Uh, so the combination of, of two modes of storytelling, uh, the, the mythic and our myths always tend to have this this quality, depending on how much uh, authority we grant them, of reaching towards our, our highest potential as humans, the, the heroic or the transcendent. Uh, you can go on your hero's journey uh, and you can uh, you won't just die in the process you will overcome the risks uh, and this is very important for humans uh, i personally think that without that mythic endeavor in fact this is something john bravaki talks about from from plato quite a lot that if you if you don't have that mythic vision in place you're essentially condemned to to slavery because you can't grasp power in the world so humans have always been doing this with our myths reinventing ourselves as something greater uh the hunter or the inventor and i think this all comes out of our uh mythic storytelling but we can also go far too far in that direction we can drift off into delusion and fantasy with our myths uh so we also have and uh, much of our modern storytelling focuses on on the pathos of life the reality of existence what's actually happening in the world around us and historically we don't have a lot of record of this from our storytelling so it's hard to know what we've what we've said in these terms before what what was the 11th century uh surf receiving in terms of storytelling about the reality of their life they had the christian mythos but was there anybody there saying uh, you know, you're you're going to die at 30 and you're going <laughs> to struggle with disease and you're going to have 16 kids and two of them will survive. That's the pathos of life. Um, but in the modern era, we've done a lot more with this. So the kind of literary tradition of storytelling, which is often in opposition with sci-fi and fantasy, uh, is really healthy. It's taking us into the, the inner experience of characters. It's showing us the detail of life. But it can also go too far in that direction. It can mm. drag us down into the pathos. Mm. So the storytelling, which is really powerful today, I think, is this combination of the two so i think if you look at something like game of thrones and its phenomenal success there's many criticisms you can make of it uh you know 
using nudity and violence and uh, spectacle to draw readers and audiences in. But I think fundamentally, George R. R. Martin's skill as a storyteller is to combine these together, to take the kind of Tolkien-esque archetypes of the young warrior, the priest, uh, the, the thief, but actually send them on a journey that explores the reality of uh, kind of human existence and power struggles as well. This is so interesting. And this brings up a lot too for me. So the way that um, postmodernism, uh, let's say, has transformed our thinking about these sorts of issues so that the whole notion of like good versus evil now seems painfully naive right and that mm -hmm. what a lot of the storytelling these days is about is like blending these and sometimes the villain is the hero and the hero is the villain and like i think of like the transformation that the batman franchise has gone through of just darkening and darkening from you know originally this sort of guy in spandex fighting the evildoers and then you get something <laughs> like the dark knight where he's like you know basically you know i will choose to be the evil villain to take on you know like the the you know the the this sort of mythic archetype that someone needs to perform in a society due to the ignorance of people and all this stuff. And it like, it's, it's very, there's a darkness to it that I think comes out of our own transformation culturally uh, through this sort of postmodern lens. That's like truth is relative mm -hmm. and uh, you know, moral claims are sort of, you know, in the eye of the beholder, there's this relativism and this sort of thing that's introduced. And the last thing I'll say about that is uh, you also mentioned game of Thrones, which I think is interesting mm -hmm. as a really good example of this, right? Because like, Yes, on the one hand, it's sort of this fantasy story uh, that is comparable on the face of it to something like Lord of the Rings. But on the other hand, it's night and day, you know, like Lord of the Rings, there is still that good versus evil and mm -hmm. like good triumphs in the end. And like, there's like, you know, there's, uh, there's something worth fighting for in this world, Mr. Frodo, you know, like it, the goodness and the Shire and that sort of a thing. And like Game of Thrones is just it's just a bloodbath of like cynical power play, you know, and like to the end, this ruthless cutthroat kind of like there are no heroes. And I find that mm -hmm. to be sort of a postmodern spin on the mythic and the and the fantasy genre. And so, yeah, I guess to wrap all of those reflections up into a question, is there something about where we are culturally coming after this postmodern moment or maybe very much still in it to some degree that renders myth in some sense either not possible or inherent? Apparently, somehow, uh, you know, uh, co complicated and problematized, and and always seeking to like, you know, uh, mm. challenge the notion of the very idea of good versus evil that seems to characterize traditional myth. You know, where are we after postmodernism with myth? Well, I think the reason we have this explosion of uh, sci-fi and fantasy storytelling, the best of it being mythopathic in its in its qualities. Um, is actually a step beyond the, the postmodern. I think this is the interesting frame of, of metamodernism that, yeah, absolutely. So one aspect of that, that progress from the pre-modern into the modern into the postmodern is going from black and white to find evil. Because in the pre-modern world, you, you're, you're like an agrarian city state and you all speak the same language and you have your mythos that joins you together, your gods, and everything outside that is evil. Uh, so we have to progress into shades of grey and moral ambiguity so we can kind of form a, a global modern and then postmodern culture. But then we actually want to say, no, there is evil. We don't want to live in a world where we can't identify evil. Uh, and that's the metamodern position. And that's why people turn back to some kind mm -hmm. of mythic storytelling. Now, if if that goes wrong, you you stray into the areas of fascism, the the reinvention of some kind of externalized evil. One of my most controversial episodes of the science fiction podcast was was asking, is J.R.R. Tolkien a fascist narrative? Um, which I would say isn't. Uh, but I only made that point an hour into it, so people got to spend <laughs> an hour an hour shouting at me. I think Tolkien was much more nuanced and wise. So that's a better word. He was a genuinely wise human. He understood the value of myth and meaning making. Uh, he is Gandalf. You know, he's not going to become Hitler. But there are many fantasy narratives in the world that do inform um, genuine fascism. 
you know, the Nazis loved Wagner uh, and the ring cycle and, and all of this stuff. So you have that problem. But what we're trying to do, I think, in the metamodern frame is to get beyond the postmodern cynicism that you're very right. Like Game of Thrones, I think, is a deeply postmodern uh, narrative. Uh, it is there? There is only power and the power struggle. I mean, this is the the Jordan Peterson point. Sorry, I'm straying a little bit here, but no, it's all you know, it's all it's all in the mix for sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Peterson likes to make this this argument that the postmoderns are obsessed with power, and I think he's making this. There's not very subtle sleight of hand it's not that the postmoderns are obsessed with power it's that our society is deeply riven by power struggles and at the postmodern level you're continually identifying mm. where these where these are but then we reach a point of, of of becoming sick of identifying the power struggles everywhere and we want to start to be able to identify some kind of um real values that we can attach ourselves to in society and i think that's why we cling on to lord of the rings because it seems to do that for us uh and it's why we have you know it's why i try to select other stories that are doing that in a meaningful sense as well yeah you know i think that what's interesting about myth mm. certainly historically was that uh it was something that brought people together that cohered a community, right? It was, there was a mm. sort of sense of which we all share the same myth, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think what one of the challenges or the interesting aspects for myth right now is that in a world that is so diverse, in a world where there are so many different narratives, yeah. what does that mean for myth in terms of cohering so many different narratives? Is it even possible? Can we even, is there a thing that can work mythically these days, um, mm. you know, in, in a in a highly kind of uh, fragmented, pluralistic uh, world of micro narratives. Is there something like micro myth? It almost seems sort of a uh, you know uh, oxymoronic or or paradoxical. So yeah, I mean, how how do how do you how does that work here in terms of like thinking about myth on the one hand as something that is sort of universal and cohering of like a whole group of people together. And on the other hand, we're dealing with the balancing of like all these divergent mm -hmm. uh, mythoses. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer to this. I, I'm very conflicted about it. So you have on one hand, like John Viveki, um And in a lot of his talking, John is saying that we have to have a, a religion that is not a religion, and we have to answer the meaning crisis without myth, without story. Mm. We can't just invent and impose a new story, which I think is, um, I'm not going to try and contradict Viveki's wisdom, you see, so I'm going to, I'm going to listen to that. But at the same time, I have this kind of desire for a new story yeah. Yeah. that can bring us all together, and I don't see us surviving actually particularly long as a species if we can't do that but then we do have kind of meta frameworks for stories so one of these is the metaverse uh no the multiverse although the metaverse crosses over uh clearly into that and i think there's a big problem with the multiverse but an interesting thing about it is that of course it contains all of these different worlds mm. and perspectives mm -hmm. and stories uh, and it even says to us as individuals, no, you're not even one person. You're you're many people and you're many unlived lives. And that's quite a useful perspective um, for people to carry into some kind of meta modern civilization that we might speculate upon. The, mm -hmm. the idea that uh, you're just one manifestation of, of infinite possibilities. Uh, or we already do this in our storytelling as well. So science fiction, before we got to the multiverse stage, was talking a lot about different worlds. The crew of the Starship Enterprise are continually negotiating between di different civilizations at different stages of their development. And that's brought a huge amount of uh, awareness and knowledge of that, the real situation we deal with in our world all the time so i i really believe that we do need a story uh 
I, I'm not convinced that we can do it yet. Yeah. If that, yeah, that makes sure. sense to you. No, it's interesting, actually. I think that that's well said. And one mm. of the things that I've come to appreciate more and more that there's sort of a, a, a meaningful difference in how uh, different folks are approaching this whole notion of a religion that's not a religion and that sort of a thing mm. is it kind of cleaves along this issue of narrative itself. Um, and Verveke and others tend to focus more on the practice side, but I agree with you that there is a narrative component that seems to be missing from that articulation. Mm. And I'm willing to say it. I'm like, okay, I'm, you know, I think Verbeke might be missing something really important um, in mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and, and so in some ways, that's kind of what my own work is starting to try to situate itself as, you know, attempting to do maybe uh, as something that's being missed from that conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so you mentioned the multiverse, and I find that very interesting. I think you're mm -hmm. right. And I think that but I'm also I'm I'm conflicted on this too because on the one hand I see this notion of the multiverse popping up and I think this might have even been in that video that you shared that uh, jet, you know started that was mm -hmm. the catalyst for this um, because uh, I it does seem to be the case that this metaverse or multiverse idea um, is increasingly popping up you see it. Uh, in the mm. Marvel Cinematic Universe as being this sort of like basically theoretical framework that is a, being what allows all these different things to come together. Um, and you see it in, you know, Rick and Morty and increasingly mm -hmm. in these different scientific or sci-fi sort of uh, worlds and, and films and that sort of a thing. Um, and particularly notably, I would say, would be uh, the film who, which just got nominated for 11 Oscars, um, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which mm -hmm. is really a kind of, I mean, it's an interesting, there's a, there's a kind of mythic element to that movie itself, but deals a lot with this notion of the multiverse and explores the issue of like living in a world where everything is everywhere all at once. Um, mm -hmm. And all that also, you know, resonating very much with another metamodern work, Bo Burnham's inside where he has that little thing about the internet being uh, everything everywhere all the time, that sort of a thing. So, what I'm getting at though is I think that this this is a, a meta modern concept that's that's um percolating and in, in, in living that's that's alive for people. This idea that there's just this multiplicity of realities that we need to navigate. But one of the things I'm conflicted with about that though is that I think that as people really explore that and sit with it, there's something uh really bothersome about it. And I don't mm -hmm. just mean that. I mean, I personally believe that at an intellectual and an empirical level, the notion, the very idea of a multiverse being real is very problematic. But leaving that aside, that not getting mm -hmm. into the science and all that, but just the the notion that like, oh, you mean there's an infinite number of other me's out there who could doing other things. And so it seems to almost render my own existence sort of less significant and everything mm -hmm. less significant because of the multiplicity itself. And so on the one hand, it seems to be a living mythic concept, but on the other hand, it seems to be doing exactly what myth uh, seeks to correct for, which is leaving people in a state of feeling like their life is meaningless and that nothing really has any significance mm -hmm. or makes sense. So that's why I would find it kind of a problematic uh, myth theme, uh, even if it is sort of, um, you know, potent for people. So I don't know, uh, we don't have to linger too long on that, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on that notion. Yeah, I mean, if you if you think about the ways that that the mythos informs our sense of who we are as humans, uh, so the the modernist mythos of uh, the the mechanism essentially left us with the idea that we're machines, expressed in science fiction as the robot or the mm. the android. Of course, if you take that seriously, or if it's embedded in your subconscious, it's going to spark a a lot of existential crisis about your your meaning in the world and the metaverse or multiverse rather has that same potential as well it takes you into the kind of sam harris misinterpretation mm. of buddhism you don't exist there, you're, you, you, there's nothing there sorry one of my cats is meowing at me <laughs> on the side here um and and that's potentially that's potentially very uh dangerous you, if you think about what acts people might take under that mythic structuring yeah uh, if you if it becomes its most most pathological and i think that's an expression of the multiverse being kind of late stage materialism uh in a scientific sense that's literally what it is it's an attempt to answer the questions we can't answer about quantum physics 
and it's a, a narrative to apply to that. So it's coming out of the logos in that way. And then it also does something in the mythos that it allows space for these the unification of different narratives. So but I, what I was saying in that video is I could see a situation where it becomes kind of imposed on our culture and we start taking it as a, as a reality mm. because it's it's coming from so many different parts of our culture. Yeah. It's coming from the mythos and the logos yeah. uh, together. I don't think that will necessarily happen. It's like a, a, a disaster situation in some ways. But it does raise the question of what what we might start saying if we say, well, really, when we're speculating on the multiverse, what that really points to is all the failings of our materialist model. Hmm. It's time to let go and, and move beyond that in some sense. But that's a very difficult discussion to have in the world today. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I. I... I would be inclined to suggest I, I, I'm interested how these ideas percolate in popular culture uh, such that I think if you were to just kind of ask the proverbial man on the street about the multiverse, they'd be like, oh, yeah, isn't that real? Isn't that I mean, like the scientists mm. are always talking, you know, there's a notion that like if you hear an idea enough, it kind of becomes true and then it kind of works its way into your own sense making and meaning making. Um, and all that really does tie very much into what we're talking about, which is like you know, big myth, but all the ways that our meaning making frameworks are being framed by various forces in a, in this sort of whatever one, whatever kind of society you want to call it, whether it's a, you know, late capitalist or, you know, uh, I don't know what, some kind of society in which there's this strange blending of sort of the you know academia talking heads and the you know corporate um sort of uh myth makers and all these and then the people coming up with your sitcom television and stuff on social media all just sort of blurs together into this sort of like well i guess we live in a multiverse and uh i guess you know i just saw this whole thing on social media that the big bang never happened so i guess that's not really real anymore mm -hmm. and you know it's just this kind of confused um situation but it all kind of seeps in and and it creates some kind of amalgam of 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 something i would presume um but i do think that all that probably has very deleterious and potentially pathological implications for people's meaning making um and that's why i do think it's really important that we should like be mm -hmm. talking and thinking about myth and the myths that we're telling and that we're telling collectively um which i guess sort of brings me to my next question which which would be like okay so that's what that's what other people are doing that's that's the stories other people are telling what about you do you do you consider um like the how would you tell a meta modern myth is there a particular story uh that you would mm. uh you know articulate or is it, a, it maybe it's not a story but it's a kind of story um you know I, it's i guess i'm asking a question that's a mixture of a couple things but it's sort of like almost asking you like what is the myth we might need <laughs> you know um mm -hmm. not what are the myths we're, we're being given but what's the myth we need um which is related to but also different from like okay well you know if these different modern myths and postmodern myths exist like what is a meta modern myth so i don't know that that's a mixture of questions i'll i'll shotgun at oh, you yeah. yeah well i am uh 100 percent uh a frustrated mythic storyteller you know what led me into studying story and myth was was the desire to create stories for for my whole life that's driven me uh along um and something that happens when you're kind of studying a very creative field is that your your tastes are always somewhat ahead of your capability mm. uh and uh, I've, I've run into this in discussions with lots of creators that um, what what you understand intellectually is is more than you can actually deliver on the page. So this creates a lot of kind of creative blocks for writers. Um, but I've also found that in my own life, the reason I've been drawn more and more towards criticism is because of the growing awareness of all the dysfunctions of our mythos. Um, and a kind of uh, wariness, or a, a bit more than that, actually, like a, an, an almost phobia of the idea that I'm going to spend my time leading people into unconscious states, and what has become mm -hmm. much more important to me 
I think also combined with a lot of time studying Buddhism and then moving beyond Buddhism, I think, is to try and bring people up to awareness. So I I think I've been delaying my storytelling, although it's always happening, until I feel it is awareness raising because so much of my mm. criticism of of what's happening in our storytelling is it's putting people to sleep and seeding mm. seeding confusion. Mm. Um but of course I have you know lots of of thoughts about our stories. But I, I don't think it is about a specific story in itself. Uh I think it is about to use some Viveki language again, that what we've been doing, so something like the multiverse, for instance, it's incredibly conceptual. It's incredibly up in the head uh, and in that part of our consciousness. And I think we need our stories to come from a more embodied place mm. than that. Mm. I, I think whatever that story is that might unify us, um, it has to do what story and myth should always be doing, but one of my critiques of science fiction is that it becomes incredibly conceptual and, and intellectual, which is a form of escape in itself. Whatever the science fiction idea is, there's a, an escape of being up in your brain. And that's always been one of my great weaknesses. Hmm. So I think the story will be, um, it will have those concepts and it will unify them with with emotion and, and feeling as well, What whatever that that new story framework is and it will operate to bring us as individuals back into that that felt sense uh, of of experience and being as well yeah i like that i think that that makes a lot of sense um there's always this sort of um inherent tension between this sort of embodied versus the conceptual and i always find these mm. tensions in various kind of communities uh, um you know wanting to make a case for for each and that sort of thing and especially on in online communities it's it's easy to get kind of lost in the conceptual heady space of things because mm -hmm. you're sort of a disembodied yep. voice communicating in the ether and so it just kind of lends itself to that um well but i am curious though i mean do you think that there is something that metamodernism as a conceptual paradigm can offer for storytellers mm. and myth um you know that that there is something that comes through from those from that set of ideas that kind of uh, moves things forward in some meaningful way. Hmm. Well, what I've observed in in metamodernism, because I think I hit a point, ha having enjoyed this corner of the the internet, uh, as Paul van der Klee calls it, uh, which which seems to have formed. I guess its origin point was like the intellectual dark web and its explosion uh onto the onto the internet at least that was one um that's one uh origin story i suppose <laughs> yeah and then kind of the integral community and some kind of meeting of the desire to be beyond the postmodern and you get metamodernism and i think metamodernism has kind of won the discussion for what the name is mm. at least that's my mm. view because mm -hmm. it engages with the most parts of whatever this this thing is and one of the things I think it does is engage with this widespread idea that was already there that I I want my Lord of the Rings. I don't want to throw it away because of some postmodern cynicism about whether there would ever be a, a pure Frodo in the world to to take the ring to the mm. cracks of doom. If there isn't a pure Frodo, I would like to try and become one, even if I fail in the process or or a Gandalf or um, and that's actually quite rare in our culture. And I think there's something in the metamodern framework, and you identify this very well, which is a willingness to be ironic and humorous, whilst also being completely sincere mm -hmm. in your intentions. Uh, and that's very important for storytellers, because you can't really tell a story from a postmodern mindset. I mean, there is lots of postmodern storytelling, but you can't touch people's heart mm. and emotions from a place of irony. Uh, you have to go beyond that to sincerity and say, this is what I believe. And I think we can go into the world and actually create something much better. And I've always mm. been drawn to the science fiction community because I think in a way it, it is metamodern in that aspect uh because in a kind of fanish 
way, although that can go wrong in many ways. It is saying, I like Star Trek because Star Trek is this vision of a world where we use science and technology to actually make things better. Uh, and for mm. me, that seems to be the meta modern position that I'm going to understand the limitations of these things, but I'm also ultimately going to pick a story that I want to see and try and make that a uh, reality. Yeah. In the world with sincerity. Yeah. There's, um, there's this whole community of, uh, hope punk authors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, instead of the, uh, kind of, uh, dystopian cyberpunk futures there's sort of a how do we envision the future in a kind of solar punk kind of hopeful uh you know yeah we can do this sort of perspective and um uh part it's just kind of a, a corner of the corner of the internet that you're talking about but it's um mm -hmm. adjacent to that well one question i have too and then we can start to wrap this up uh because we're about an hour here um mm -hmm. i'm curious to know like what what myths uh does damian walter live by Oh, that's a good question. Um, one book that really influenced me, my mother read it to me when I was very young. I was very fortunate that my mom was very literate. She was older when I was born as well. So sometimes it's good to have a, an older parent. And she was very much into, into myth and she studied linguistics as well. Mm. Um, so she read me uh, uh, a bunch of novels by Mary Reno who's a British novelist, uh, she was lesbian and she lived in Greece for most of her life. And she had kind of become famous writing gay romances at a time when that was still illegal. Homosexuality was still illegal in the UK. So they were kind of, the gay romance was hidden mm. in the subtext of the story. Mm. But then she wrote about uh, lots of, basically a history of classical Greece across seven or eight novels, uh, starting with Theseus, and she writes this beautiful novel about the young Prince Theseus, who is the founding hero of Athens and obviously fights the Minotaur, but she makes this much more realistic in her storytelling. And that heroic prince archetype is also quite small. I and mean, I'm relatively small on the scale of, of guys, and he uses uh, wrestling skills to, to win fights. Mm -hmm. And that heroic archetype I've always been aware, like made it very deep into my into my psyche. Hmm. Uh, so I think like a like a lot of men, I carry this this heroic archetype within, which I then had a lot of struggles to to integrate hmm. into into life. And this is why one of the areas that I explore in uh, in the science fiction podcast and more broadly is masculinity. Uh, and there's always been this deep tie between masculinity and and myth mm. as well. There's a number of figures you can point to who've who've tried to address the crisis of masculinity mm. through the exploration of of uh, of myths. Yeah. Um, so I I I think that's a real um, struggle in our world today is integrating this heroic archetype that I yeah. think men really need into then the, the higher levels of of development yeah it's painful to see when it doesn't work out effectively when it when it isn't integrated mm. particularly well and then you get some yeah. some unfortunate side side effects but i think you're right and i mean um i mean obviously the the uh the sort of elephant in the room there would be jordan peterson i think who you know very much explores the of terrain both yeah. of myth and meaning but also uh masculinity and this whole mm -hmm. you know crisis of men's identity uh, these days and that sort of a thing and um yeah i think that that is deeply important and it's sort of like it's a recurring need to do well and um uh i think again, the reason yeah i think the reason peterson was successful and we had to to credit him mm. is that there's a very large community of men who weren't given that heroic archetype uh, mm. we try to we have a developmental crisis of trying to take young people generally but i think it's more serious with men and advance people to post-modernity mm. essentially mm -hmm. with or at least modernity without doing all of the pre-modern stuff that mm. kids really need yeah uh, and so much of what's happening with, with young men particularly at the moment is a product of that and peterson 
addresses that. I don't think he produces the right answer at the end of it, which is important. But Yeah. And then there's always the issue of what gets lost in translation too. Peterson might, mm -hmm. when he's at his best, be able to really you know, explore those nuances very effectively. Right. But there's also then, you know, as you uh, mentioned earlier on, there's sort of a whole uh, aspect to the internet persona that can play into these sorts of dynamics of the woke culture war fighting back against that and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of benefit from that. And there's strong right. inclination and incentive to do that, that becomes a hindrance to uh, probably more healthy development. But um but yeah, I think I think all those dynamics are really important. Uh, but another, I guess, to to uh, to ask the question slightly differently, not just archetypes, are there particular stories, the story of your life or the story of lives today that are possible that orient you towards the future in a meaningful way that you feel like work? uh in a in a in a way that it has a kind of mythic resonance that's sort of like i am here to do this or i am here and by being here i do this and that that does something meaningful and there's a kind of mythic quality to my sense of being oriented and i think that this also does tie into this sort of hero's journey sensibility of like you know, mm -hmm. the hero is the person who does the thing that needs to be done and there's a way in which like uh myth uh, a working myth, a living myth is something that structures your um, thinking about the world and orients you in a particular way mm. so that you can get up every morning and do something and live meaningfully and produce things and contribute to society and to other people and to relationships and that sort of thing and to yourself in a meaningful, sustainable way. Um, do you think that there is something that that could work like that for for? many people a particular story is there a particular story that you are oriented by um and it, you know mm. so instead of like necessarily the images or the archetypes but more like the narrative uh structure of mm -hmm. your own existence <laughs> uh i think there is um a, a, a confusion and conflation in our uh on our mythic level today of the creator and the celebrity Hmm. Uh, and the reason so many young people are drawn to celebrity as the answer to all of their problems, I'm going to be whatever stage of celebrity it is, a TikToker at the moment, um, is because really probably the most constructive archetype, uh, modern or postmodern archetype, is the creator hmm. uh, in the broadest sense of that and of that word um because i know that's where i find my not balance in the world but the the ability to go forward and do things mm. and take risks in the world having you know personally grown up in a you know very fortunately a, a western world but a very poor um background mm. you know so how do you make those leaps to to go to college when you don't have the money to do that or the family support how do you start your own business how do you say i'm going to be a writer when that seems like a suicidally risky <laughs> uh thing to do on a mm -hmm. on a financial level and i think it is this model of the creator mm. uh that we have when it's when it's kind of reduced into celebrity it's not very healthy mm. um but when we can start to think about because it leads into all of these internal conflicts that we have how do you operate creatively in the world um, how do you create your own mythos around mm. yourself uh, as well? And this is kind of, maybe it's a step on from the individual. Uh, the, the point of being the individual, you are atomized and isolated from the world. But if you can turn your individuality into creativity mm. instead, mm -hmm. it means you must be networked with all these other people you must be connected because what you are creating must engage with people so that you get stuff back mm. even if it's just getting paid for doing it or receiving feedback mm. so i think if we were to look healthily i did write an essay about this many years ago actually about creator culture before i understood the issues really involved but i think that might be an answer that i would give to our complexity that the more we can support the individual to become the creator, whether it's starting a business or making art or rearing a family or whatever it is that mm. is your outlet for creativity, 
and remove the barriers to doing that, the less dysfunctional our world would become. Mm. If everyone felt creatively fulfilled, the culture war would disappear. Yeah, I really, I really like that a lot. It it also highlights a certain kind of distinction between the creator and the influencer, which is now sort of increased this sort of new category. Um, And you're not necessarily making anything, but you're apparently influential, sort of just abstracting the celebrity aspect and and running with that even uh, without the creativity, arguably. I don't know, maybe being harsh. What's that? Uh, our, our culture is at the moment very open about its corruption. <laughs> like we call we call art content. Mm. We call creators influencers. Mm. We call stories franchises. Yeah. Because um, we've even forgotten that if they have become these things, that's a real problem mm. in our culture. Hmm. That's a really good point. I like that too. Um, and it's 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 hard to know on the one hand if that's if that honesty is is a good thing, because at least then it's not sort of um, this sort of, uh, you know, mendacious kind of uh, hiding of reality. But on the other hand, it's a it's a very impoverished way to grow mm. up in a society where you don't grow up in, with stories and creators. You grow up with franchises and influencers right. and this sort yeah. of um, kind of naked, bald owning of uh, the own the degradation, I guess, of those sorts of things. Um any anything we didn't cover in this conversation around myth and narrative and story and um, meta modernity and whatnot that you'd want to throw into the mix here at the end? No, I I think we got into a a, a lot of it. I was I was thinking maybe of asking you some stuff about emergentism, but maybe we'll maybe I'll invite you back. Okay, for sure. An the science fiction podcast. We'll I'd love that. that. More we we'll do that in a more fulfilled way because uh, there's some ideas in science fiction like psycho history, which is from Isaac Asimov, the idea uh-huh. you could have a science that lets you predict the future. Yeah. And it seems in a way to to tie into something like emergentism. So I'd love it if we could talk about that at some point. Sure. Yeah. A friend of mine yeah. really recommended this book, which I think you might have even mm. mentioned, uh yep. to Star Maker by Olaf Stable. And and I, I haven't read it yet, but they're they're reading about emergentism and stuff. They're like, Oh, you've got to read this book. And so they uh, turned me on to some sci-fi stuff. So I'm like, all right, well, so um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be lovely. I'd love to to do that at some point and talk about that. Um, But uh, yeah, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for um, coming on and sharing your thoughts about this. Uh, You've got, uh, you know, a wonderful podcast and you're putting out some, you're putting out some great content, (laughs) Um, uh, but I will, um, I'll put a link to your uh, cool podcast and and the stuff you're doing on YouTube and stuff. And um, uh, make sure people are familiar with that. And uh, yeah, anything you want to share in terms of stuff you're working on at the moment that you want to get out there or, uh, or. Where people uh, watching this want to join in some of the uh, sci-fi moving into metamodernism discussions. Mm. I have a science fiction group on Facebook. I, I'm just trying to get it above 25,000 members mm. at the moment. So if like a hundred more people come and join, then then we'll have got there. So I'll, I'll plug that. Okay. And it's the best place to kind of have these discussions cool. uh, online for me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what's that called, the group? Uh, it's called Just Science Fiction. And it it has orange artwork. If you look for the orange <laughs> okay. group on Facebook. Great. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, hey, Damien Walter, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This has been a great conversation. Uh, best to you and uh, your work, and uh, we'll be in touch. So thanks again. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Brennan.